power motors on one size pump. So you can put a 20, 30, 40, 50 horsepower motor on the same 23SH pump, this being the business end of the unit. So you've got that motor adapter. The seal chamber fits onto the motor adapter. What does the seal chamber do for us? What's that? Holds the seal. Which half of the seal does it hold? The non-rotating. Hopefully the stationary. If it's holding the rotating one, we're in deep trouble. Right, so the seal chamber, it's simply a separate piece so we can have a high precision tolerance fit for that stationary seal. If that fit, when we go to take this pump apart, for that one seal face, that stationary seal face, don't drop it, Zach. <laughs> if that fit for that stationary is is a bad fit, and if you've, if you've got a bunch of dirt and debris or corrosion or whatever it is in that bore where that seal head fits, and you go and press a new seal in there, it's going to squeeze and distort that seal. It might chip it, it might damage it. At the least, it's probably going to squeeze it and make it oblong, and then it's no longer flat. So we need to make sure we keep that. That's a critical spot that needs to make sure it's clean. Next piece over, you've got the mechanical seal. Here they show it as just one big piece. The mechanical seal is actually three or four pieces. We'll get to that. Then we've got a casing O-ring. Casing O-ring is going to be sandwiched between the seal chamber, which you cannot see, and the casing of the pump. That just keeps stuff from leaking out of the side of the pump. So if you, if you ever have a pump that has a leak in this area, between the blue and the stainless, it's that O-ring got pinched probably when the pump was put together. If the seal leaks, it's going to be leaking in, in this area. You've then got a sleeve. The sleeve is simply a machined piece of, in, in our case here, stainless steel, which is nice and smooth for the mechanical seal, the rotary, the rotating portion of the mechanical seal, to be installed onto, instead of installing it directly onto the motor shaft. The other benefit is if something happens and you've got a process upset and you've got nasty chemicals, I'd rather the sleeve gets chemically attacked or corroded or abraded or damaged than the shaft of the motor. We've got some that just came back from a facility for you guys where the motor shaft was damaged and then the motor shop wants $3,000 for a pair of $5,000 motor. You may as well buy a new motor. So the sleeve, that's kind of a sacrificial element. If the seal goes haywire, gets damaged, it's going to whack the sleeve before it whacks the motor shaft, and that way at least you can replace just an inexpensive sleeve. We've then got a sleeve gasket. Let's draw this one out real quick. So we've got, we've got the motor, motor shaft. We just put, we just said we're going to put a sleeve on there, which is what your, I'm going to draw it as a big block, which is what your rotating seal face is going to ride on. Well now we just introduced another leak pad under that sleeve, between the sleeve and the motor shaft. So we need to be able to, to create a seal path here so that we don't have that leakage. So you see that you've got a, they call it a sleeve gasket. It's a gasket that goes on the face of that sleeve to prevent that leak path from, from being an issue. And then you've got the back of the impeller is going to ride up and compress against the sleeve gasket, sealing that off. So again, we're just trying to isolate any leak path back to the mechanical seal as we're only Last but not least, we've got this, this weird looking shape here behind the impeller. It's called a spring retainer. These aren't all the parts to the seal. We'll see on the new seal it also has a coil spring. And that coil spring, if you want to get real technical, the coil spring provides a closing force for the seal when you're not pumping. But it needs something to push against. Rather than pushing on the impeller, we give it a nice little stainless steel cuff or a spring retainer to push against. Then we've got the impeller itself. The impeller rotates with the shaft. The shaft rotates because the motor's energized. The flow comes in the impeller this way, in the suction side of the pump, and out that way. Just like the Gravitron, centrifugal force. It wants to go to the largest diameter as that impeller spins. Uh, the impeller spins on the motor shaft. It's driven by a key. There's actually two points of connection between the shaft and the impeller. We've got a nut or a bolt. In this case it showed as a, a stud and a impeller washer, but basically a bolt that holds the impeller onto the shaft. All that does is hold it tight against the shaft and against the sleeve. Then you've got a key that drives it. So the key transmits all the torque. 
So if I drop a screwdriver in this pump and turn it on, what's probably going to happen? Shear the key. Shear the key. The bolt might still be intact, but you're going to shear the key and then possibly have a motor running on the inside of that impeller, but the impeller not running. Or if you spin the pump backwards and then start it up. <laughs> That's a classic one, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, if the pump rotates backwards and then you start it up immediately, you've got a lot of rotating mass in that little impeller. You know, it may weigh five, six, seven, eight pounds. But if it's spinning back, backwards pretty quick, and then you jolt it and hard start it at 3,600 or 1,800 RPM in the other direction, you might shear that key. Or you might just deform that key to the point where you've created a loose fit. And now that impeller rattles around, and then that bolt loosens up, and then you get water back behind the impeller, and then it corrodes your motor shaft, and then you need a new motor. And then you've got the casing itself. This is a hydroform stainless steel welded casing. Um, we'll pop that open here in a couple minutes and we'll see some parts and pieces that are, that are inside of that. So seals. A couple key things. Seal faces, pretty delicate. We don't want to put our fingers and hands on the seal faces. I've seen a lot of guys get grease on there. We do a little of this and then they put it back in service. Just keep your fingers like this at all times if you can. When we install one of these, we actually have to push on the face, so we'll use a nice clean rag to do that. We'll make sure that we don't get contaminants. Nice, hang gloves. We're going all out. He's got like 10 pair. Everyone's going to get a crack at it. <laughs> uh, so we'll do that when we install the stationary, and that's it. Now, Brandon, the only other thing that we may need is like a palm olive dish soap, a little bit of water. Yes, any, any type of clean soap and water? That won't work. It's got alcohol. Does it have like grit? It can't be the pumice style. Yeah, just like clean, you know, dish soap. Just enough to put a little cup and make some soap and water. There's uh, this bellows, we need to slide this onto the shaft. And it, it's a compression fit. Remember, we're trying to eliminate a leak path there. So it's going to be pretty tight to get it on there. So usually what we do is we soak everything in soapy water, slide it on there. A couple seconds later, that soapy water pretty much evaporates and it's stuck where it's going to be. But if we don't have a a means of lubrication, we might install this and it might not be all the way seated and it may not give the appropriate compression on the seal face. Any questions? All right. So, who wants to volunteer? I'll do it, but I mean, the safety guard, this is good. You've got uh, 12 easy steps for disassembly. A lot of those are the basics. Starts with disconnecting power, being safe. And then we've got, looks like 16 steps Reassembly. I added a few steps from the IOM manual. I kind of customized it for you guys because the IOM manual, frankly, it's a good IOM manual, but there's a lot of tricks to make it a little bit simpler to get the seal installed. So we're going to start with with uh, steps one through twelve for the pump disassembly, and then we'll take it from there. Brandon's going to be the head guy. If anybody wants to kind of crowd around, maybe behind you guys will get a better view of what's going on inside the pump. Sure, I'm just going to All right, so the drain. Step one, we need to get this uh, casing off, so Brandon, you got a set of wrenches. At a pretty specific pump range, flow range, and if you're operating at zero gallons per minute, the bearings are loaded up different than they were designed for. The shaft is loaded up different than it was designed for. It creates a bad situation. When you deadhead, all that horsepower from the motor goes into the, into the fluid in there. It doesn't translate into fluid motion. So when you deadhead the pump, you, you can generate a tremendous amount of heat. I've seen pumps, stainless steel pumps, get discolored because they generated so much heat. And the water inside of them is basically steam. You know, it's, pretty nasty. So we don't like the deadhead. The other thing we don't like to do is dry run pumps. What would dry running be? It's pretty intuitive. No water. Yeah, no water. Someone forgot to open the suction valve, so pumps running, everything looks good, nothing's coming out of it because nothing's going into it. That's a bad situation, predominantly because you've got this mechanical seal that's screaming along at 1700 or 3600 RPM with no cooling mechanism. All right, so we do need flow. In addition, inside of this pump you'll see on the impeller, <coughs> It's got wear rings on the impeller and the casing on both sides of it. And if you've got no fluid inside the pump, it's possible for those wear rings to maybe contact and you've got metal on metal contact with no, no uh, method of lubrication. 
right? Good to go. Can you pop the casing off? Justin, where's your sledgehammer? <laughs> this on the floor. Here's your casing o-ring. All this casing o-ring does is seal between this between this uh, what do I call that? Seal chamber. That's the back section of the pump here. Casing seals between that. I'm sorry, the casing o-ring seals between that and the casing. So again, if you've got any type of leak in this general area of the pump, first and foremost, when you put the pump back together, it's possible that it was this o-ring. So first thing I do when we disassemble I just go along this, feel it with your hand, see if there's any pinch points, cuts, nicks, leak pads. Usually, usually, typically not. Brown. Brown means Viton. That's what this this color is. It's pretty chemically savvy, especially for clean water and, and the basic stuff you guys might be doing. We're going to keep that in a clean spot, safe from getting pinched or cut. So here we've got your uh, impeller. Take a look at the casing real quick. Oh, types of fun debris in there. Here's the casing. You've also got a casing drain down here at the bottom so you can drain the pump out. If you've got a leak path that's coming out the bottom of the pump. It's possible. I've seen guys drop casings or bump them and, and crack that well. So that, that's a potential leak spot. Or you might just have the, the drain plug not in, which is, is possible. Notice in the casing, in this area right here, this is the suction. This is where all the suction fluid comes in and gets introduced into the impeller. In this area, we've got a real tight tolerance. That rides right here around the nose of the impeller. You can look at that impeller. It's pretty much a, pretty much a mirror finish around here. If you've got a situation where you're running a pump at deadhead, that's not where that shaft was, was designed around. So you can get different shaft loads. You can actually deflect that shaft and potentially run the nose of this impeller into this wearing. That's the bad news. The good news is these wearings, you can pop them out and put a new one in so you don't have to buy a whole new casing so long as this impeller isn't destroyed. And there's also one, I believe, on the back end of the impeller too. Same principle. So suction fluid comes in here on the pump as that impeller rotates. And who can tell me direction of rotation? Anybody know? Does it go this way or this way? What's that? You got it. Absolutely, it goes this way. Centrifugal pumps, they always sweep. They don't push, they don't pop, they sweep. So just think of it like a, a ball on a rope. Your hand always leads the ball a little bit. That's what we're doing here. The same exact uh, forces are imposed. So discharge pressure is coming out in this direction. The reason we've got that tight fit between the suction nose on the impeller and the, the casing is so that the high pressure fluid coming out of the discharge of the pump can't sneak back and around. We've got such a tight fit here, it creates a little barrier, it just makes it tough for it to, to happen. So your mechanical seal, it actually sits behind the impeller. It's going to be exposed pretty much to, to the high pressure coming out of the discharge. All right. So we need to realize that, that we're not just sealing suction conditions, which are typically pretty low pressure. You might be sealing discharge pressure conditions, which could be pretty high pressure. Not much else happening inside the casing. A little bit of debris. See if we can catch some of it. Nah. Put it on some white paper. I'm just trying to see. Always keep your new seal in a safe spot. Usually, when I pop pumps open, I like to see any debris that's in there. Try to collect it, put it on a piece of white paper, or, or shake it out in your hand just so you can identify maybe what it is. If, if it was a potential cause of failure. So now we're going to take the impeller off. Metric. I have no idea. <laughs> Is it metric? It's metric. <laughs> it's metric. <laughs> Don't have any metric sockets. Made in America. Oh. Not metric? 1116, sorry. Pretty close to me. 
So a few things before we uh, zap this impeller off. We just put a wrench on this, it's going to turn with the motor. Some pumps come with a, a motor not directly built onto them where you can grab onto the shaft on one end and a wrench on the other end and break it loose. In this case we can't do that, so we're opening an impact gun, just zapping that will bust it loose. If it doesn't, what we don't want to do is jam something down into the impeller to lock it in place and then do one of these and really get your biggest guy on it. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Break the impeller. What's that? Break the impeller. Yeah, you could damage the impeller, maybe bend it. It's pretty beefy, but usually winds up what winds up happening is you might bend the motor shaft a tiny bit, and then the impeller runs like this, and the seal's back there then running like this. We want to keep that seal pretty darn flat. So, Brandon, have at it. Let's see if we can take that one. Easy, easy as can be, right? It's not always that easy. If it's not that easy, putting a strap wrench around the impeller, that's a proper technique. And that way you're not, not putting all those loads on it. So taking a look at the, uh, looks like we got a little crud behind there. Taking a look at the impeller washer, it's actually a stud and a washer, has an integral O-ring in it. Make sure you don't lose that O-ring because that's sealing liquid from leaking past the impeller and down the shaft in that direction. It's okay to put a little RTV or something on there. Don't go crazy with the RTV and silicone. I've seen pumps on occasion just oozing it everywhere. I've never really had to do that, so. I'll leave this so we don't need that over. All right, now we can get the impeller off. If you look in here, the impeller, it's not really connected to the shaft any, anymore. It's a, a loose fit now. The only thing that holds the impeller onto the shaft is this nut, putting it in compression in this direction. This nut does not transmit any torque though. We've got a key between the impeller and the shaft in order to transmit all that rotational torque. So if, if the impeller was spinning in this direction and then we started the motor and it starts spinning in that direction, this 10 pound little weight might be able to, to shear yeah, that key off the shaft and then it loosens up that tight fit between the impeller and the shaft. So Brandon's got to take two pry bars. I recommend if you're going to do this, get your pry bars between uh, right on the vein of the impeller. That's this meaty portion right here. That's where you want to get your pry bars between so you don't wind up bending the, uh, and you want to use a quick, you know, popping action as opposed to a pry. There you go. I'm down in my shop. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Brent. Now with the impeller, it's important you don't want to drop it because if you damage this surface on the impeller, that rides within the casing. If you create a buckle or, or make this oblong or create some type of spur here, you might get galling or contact inside your pump casing. We can pass this around, just don't drop it. That's the heart of the, of the pump and it'll ruin my demonstration. Uh, inside the impeller, you've got veins. Those are what capture the water and impart that centrifugal force, converting it into pressure. On the back side, You've also got a hub or a, I guess a nose on the back side of the impeller as well. It's going to ride within this wear ring on the back side of the impeller. That helps isolate the pressure going back to the mechanical seal a little bit. It creates a little pressure barrier for it. I'll pass that around. It's extremely sharp on the veins, so hold it, hold it from the ends for safety's sake. This is the spring retainer that goes on the back side of, of the impeller. Spring retainer simply keeps that coil spring from having to contact the impeller directly. If something goes crazy with your mechanical seal and this spring starts spinning like nuts because it gets locked up on the other end, you don't want it scoring your impeller immediately. This just acts as a little barrier. Plus it gives it a nice, nice clean finish to ride again. Spring. Again, the spring just provides closing force for the mechanical seal when the pump is off, basically. Why do I say when the pump is off? What, cre what creates a closing force on the seal faces when the pump is on? The rotation. Close? The rotation. It's not the rotation. It's actually the pressure of the fluid. So another reason not to deadhead your pump, the higher the pressure you run on these pumps, the greater closing force you have in your seal faces, which means the more heat that you generate. So the, the spring there, it's only there, to, it's only there to create a little buffer. Um, the other reason it's there is if for some reason you operate it under vacuum pressure, it compensates for that as well. So it's going to be able to provide just enough closing force to oppose vacuum pressure, which normally we're not running in that situation. Who's paying attention to our steps? I am not. Uh, let's see, we've got the two pry bars, remove the shaft sleeve, spring, cup washer, you've got a shaft sleeve here, so you have to pull that out. 
is also going to have a rotating portion of the seal. So if you can get a pry bar on that seal, it should slide out right as soon as you get that key out of the way. Key. Hose, give the key a good look. If you see any scores or lines or steps in your key, that's usually an indication that, that you've had a lot of uh, alternating rotation or looseness in your assembly, which a loose key is just going to wind up equaling failure, so we don't want that. That sleeve is just a slide fit on that shaft, so it should prop right out. There you go. Here's where carts fall all over the floor. <laughs> All right. So we've got a few parts here. I don't know if we'll be able to get this one off easily. Nope. I'd have to beat that one off. We've got a, a sleeve. The sleeve provides a nice mirror finish for the rotating portion of the mechanical seal to ride on. Notice here's the shaft that it's got a keyway cut in it, so it's probably not the ideal sealing surface for a mechanical seal. So this sleeve simply gives us that nice machine surface. It's got a sleeve O-ring on the back end of it which rides against the backside. Oh, you guys are passing the impeller around. That O-ring here seals against the backside of the impeller, preventing a leak path from uh, behind the impeller and in between the motor sleeve. And then you've got the rotating portion of the seal. This has the rubber boot underneath it, which gives that seal head some, some flexibility. You can see how I can move that seal head. But that rubber bellows is still squeezed between this, this band and that sleeve. So that rubber bellows is still providing leak path protection from behind the mechanical seal, even though it allows us to have some flexibility. It's like an O-ring, just better. It's an accordion bellows. And then you've got the rotating seal face, which is right here. I can touch it now because we're not going to reuse it because it was leaking. So you've got the rotating face here. The stationary face is way back there. It's pressed in place in the, in the seal chamber itself. So I'll pass this around. Uh, and then we'll need to figure out how to get that off of the sleeve at some point. And I lose any parts. All right, now we can take this guy off. Just pop off. All right. Boom. So what's this guy called? Seal chamber. Seal chamber. You got it. That's a seal chamber. Yes. You don't get a prize. <laughs> Free problems. The seal chamber, again, it's simply a, a machined housing. It, it does a little bit hydraulically. It allows, it allows to uh, help create that discharge path, path for the fluid. So uh, it's got a notch on here. You see this little tab? That tab has to line up in the casing just right when you put this back together. If you try to put this together like this, you're going to be fighting yourself. So keep an eye on that tab. It should line up in the casing just right. Your discharge should always be right in that area. And then it's got a nice machine surface in there to, to install your stationary seal face. That's what this black ring is, probably silicon carbide, nice real hard, hard metal. If you look at that without touching it, it's almost mirror finish. Pretty darn good condition. Where's that uh, sleeve? Oh, you're still passing around? All right, yeah, keep, keep playing. So that's it, guys. And then this piece here, of course, is the motor adapter. We could take that off, we don't need to. Really, all this piece here does is adapt from the casing to your different motor frame size, 20, 30, 40, 50 horsepower. That's it. Stationary seal is in the seal chamber. So all of our sealing is happening between this carbon face and that silicon carbide non-rotating face. What happens when, when you dry run a pump or when you deadhead a pump, you build up so much heat that you lose the lubricity between the two seal faces. No lubricity between two pieces of almost glass. catches. You got it. You build up a ton of friction. It wants to catch. Well, what's transmitting all our torque now that I'm dirty? The bellows is transmitting all of your torque. So that's probably why you have a bellows rip. Plus, it gets really hot really quick. I've seen stainless steel blued just from water and friction. You know, a boiler feed system at a local customer running 200 degree water, and they didn't have the proper lubrication going through the seal. That 200 degree water became X many hundred degree water and actually blued stainless steel, it got so hot. So, so you've got a nice rubber bellows here. That's just gonna become weak and elastic and eventually blow out. So that was your lead.
Let's talk about oils and WD-40 and what are our shop favorites? What are, what are the shop favorite lubricators? <laughs> PB Blaster. Uh, yeah, PB all that blaster. stuff. Right? PB Blaster. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, you know, go for the blue too. Yeah, be real careful with, especially pumps, because I'm the pump guy. Just be real careful with pumps when you're using different lubricants on O-rings. You've got many different types of elastomers. You've got nitrile, Buna, EPDM, Viton, Teflon, not really an elastomer, uh, Calrez. There's, there's a lot of different types of O-rings, and we call them elastomers in general. Some of them are awesome when you're dealing with stuff like hand sanitizer and hydrocarbons and solvents and gasoline and real light stuff and greases. Some of them are really good with acids. Some of them are op opposite ends of the spectrum though. So it's pretty rare to find that one O-ring or elastomer that's really good with acids that's also awesome with your shop grease or oil. So when you're putting pumps and things back together, if you've got an O-ring and you want to stick it in place, just be real careful with what you pick. Oh, you're looking a little angry face. We can use that wire brush. Yeah, that's more fun. Yeah. 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 We could just disintegrate into jelly. You want to be real careful about that. When in doubt, dish soap. Dish soap works great. Uh, yeah, there's only a couple of applications where they don't like dish soap, like automotive paints, because dish soap has silicone in it, and then it fish eyes the paint everywhere. So, But we deal with that stuff. But what you guys are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, something like dish soap, just to hold your, give your O-ring some tack, hold it in place, soapy water to, to loop parts on to get them to, to slide in. That's what I would recommend. You go reach for the bucket of grease or that that there blue oil it's always <laughs> the right stuff that's when i get in trouble because i've done it before and you wind up having an o-ring swell up and you split up so now we need to get this old seal off of the sleeve you can see getting it off is going to be just as fun as getting it on glad to help <laughs> now on that shaft yeah should we put any never seize on that yeah not? it's okay to put never seize or anything really you want on the shaft that's that's not a bad idea at all um, the only time we don't like using never sees is when you've got thanks George when you've got a situation where you want to get bite between two pieces. For example, <laughs> on the casing itself, this wear ring that goes on the suction side of the casing, that's a metal disc that you can pop out and press a new one in. You put never sees on that to make it go in real easy. It might start spinning when it's pumping and it'll come out real easy. And then all of a sudden you've got a Problem. Normally another thing, um, I've got it back in my truck, I can go get it if you'd like to, to do a demo. Uh, I'll typically check the shaft to make sure the set shaft is still straight. If we've had a process upset or some kind of situation where it's an older pump coming back, you know, we always check the bearings to make sure they fit tolerance wise. And then we'll use a dial indicator and check that shaft for run out. We'll do a, 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 an entire sweep of shaft rotation to make sure the shaft isn't doing this as it rotates. Why is that important? What's that? Your seal. You got it. Your, your seal's going to be doing this too. And if your seal's doing that, it's going from parallel to not parallel and back and forth. And you're going to get almost a dishing effect. You're not going to be sealing perfectly between those two seal heads. Earlier when I talked about cleanliness, is why wearing gloves and stuff when you go to do the actual seal install is important. You get this kind of grit and debris on that seal face, put the whole pump back together, that's what you're starting with on a brand new seal line. Not a great effect. So I've got another helper. Who wants to try to get this seal face out? You might be able to pop it out. Probably not. I just need someone to beat that out for me. Yeah, it'll probably shatter if you use that. That's okay. It's, it's the old seal You got safety buttons? <laughs> it is silicon carbide. <laughs>
Well, you got half of that. Well, that's good. Right? I thought you split it. All right, so seal chamber. Instead of using an O-ring to seal around that stationary seal face, we use a, a rubber boot. I don't know if it's EPDM, EPDM or Vitam. It's got a green dot on it, which I think is EPDM, which is a type of lens. <laughs> so for reassembly, a couple things. I don't know if we caught this on tape, but we were saying earlier, lubricants that you use, stay away from, from any oil bases or anything like that for any reassembly because the O-rings can have a chemical reaction to it. They can swell, they can split. When in doubt, just use a little bit of palm olive soap or dish soap. None of the pumice-based soap with the grit in it. Just something that's nice and clean that'll wash away with water. Use that as a lubricant or something to stick an O-ring in place and hold it. So for reassembly, step number one, we want to clean the parts off. Uh, don't get out the flapper wheel. We're just using a little emery paper or, or scotch rice pad. Talk about checking the shaft run out. Again, that'd be using a dial indicator on the shaft to make sure you don't have a bent shaft. We can do that if you'd like. I've got one in the truck. You have to pause. Yeah. You want to do it? All right, we'll pause. We're going to right, dial indicator. We're going to use this dial indicator here. It's a piece of equipment to measure precision changes in uh, in motion. In our case, we're going to use it to measure whether or not the shaft has any relative side-to-side -side movement to it as we rotate the shaft. That's simply going to indicate if the shaft is bent or not. A uh, sheet of paper, your typical sheet of paper, if we were to measure it using a dial indicator or a pair of calipers, is about three thousandths of an inch thick. And we want to keep this shaft running true. We call it total indicator runout from side to side, extreme to extreme, about five thousandths of an inch is what our allowable tolerance is for a mechanically sealed pump at the mechanical seal. Maybe something different way out here where the impeller is, but at the mechanical seal we only want to allow about five thousandths of an inch run out. The reason is the reason is you've got your stationary way back here and your rotary right here. If you've got shaft, a shaft that's bent or distorted, the stationary is not moving but the rotary is going to be moving with the shaft. And you may actually, rather than get a tr getting a true concentric rotation between the two, you may get an eccentric wobble or you know some type of back and forth and that'll wind up uh, causing sealing issues. So you set up your dial indicator, you make sure nothing's actually touching the pump housing itself, including Brandon. <laughs> we set her to uh, zero. In this case you've got a shaft that has a keyway on it, so we're going to start at one end of the keyway. I put the impeller nut back on there just so I have something to turn the shaft with without touching the uh, dial indicator itself. Right now it's reading zero. We want to keep an eye on the needle and see how far out that dial indicator runs as we do a full revolution. So we're holding zero, zero, and we're about one thousand. So that's not bad. Total indicator reading of about a thousandth of an inch. That's well within the five thousandths of an inch. All that means is that we don't have a bent shaft. And that's it. If you did have a bent shaft, you'd see that needle value change forward and back as you went through a full revolution. Dial indicator test. That's it. Reassembly. You guys are so good, you already lost all your pamphlets and <laughs> you know how to do it. Alright, so we cleaned everything. We checked the shaft for total indicator run out of five thousandths or less. We had about one thousandths of an inch, which is pretty good. Uh, mechanical seal components. We didn't really talk about this, but Someone may say, yeah, these look like they're still pretty good. Let's reuse them. You never want to really reuse, especially on these mechanical seals. They're a couple hundred bucks. You don't want to reuse these seal components. It's just not worth the risk. I've got some, in my garage, I've got a $12,000 seal that's going out for delivery. That might be something where we'd reuse the seal faces because it'll take eight weeks to make them. But something like this, we've got them sitting on the shelf. We can send you a new pair the same day if you need it. So try not to reuse those types of things. Uh, the wearings being replaced, we talked about this earlier. <laughs> The wearings in the casing and the seal chamber, um, if they're damaged, rip them out, put new ones in. Don't use never sees or anything like that behind them because it could loosen them up during rotation. Here it says it's not recommended to use an old impeller bolt and o-ring. Um, we're reusing the impeller bolt and o-ring today. All right. I think I received in there. So on the side, I might have one.
Oh, the case over? Uh, this one looked pretty good. We could use a new one if you like. Never hurts to just keep a spare on the shelf. I gave it a good one over earlier. It looked pretty good. All right. Uh, install the mechanical seal stationary seat. So step one, we need to install the mechanical seal stationary back into the, the housing here. This is where cleanliness, cleanliness is everything. So we've got our new stationary and rotary seal here. This is where not dropping the seal is also very important. There it is. We've got the nice clean rag. Got some gloves. Yeah, you want to open that? All right. Tell you what, uh, can you throw some water in that cup? We'll make a little soapy water. Good job. <laughs> so we're using gloves so that we have nice clean hands when we're touching the seal. I'm going to try to get all the tools and stuff just out of the way a little bit. You'll notice a slight difference from, from the old seal to this seal. This one has a brown boot to it, and that's because it's Viton. This is a, a seal where both faces are silicon carbide, so they're both very hard materials. And that way, if you've got any sand in your process or you know, just any nasty process. It's uh, a little bit more robust of a seal. All right. So take the spring out so that doesn't fall. Notice how the seal comes. Here's your rotary, brand new. You want to make sure that doesn't fall onto uh, onto a workbench and get chipped or anything to that effect. So we're going to put that right here. You got your stationary. Try not to touch the seal faces itself. Move the cardboard out of the way. If you need it, you can use a little soapy water to lubricate the interface when we press that seal down into its uh, seat. Usually we like to try to just use a, a swift, big guy, you know, push motion, and that should, should do the job. The nice thing about soapy water, if it gets on the seal faces, it's not abrasive. As soon as that seal runs, it'll just wipe it all away. So, so that's what we're going to try to do here. Just get a little bit of uh, soapy water on this all the while, trying not to drop the seal face. Remember, try not to touch things so you don't get grease on it. Nice, even, even big guy push around that seal face. And we're done. Now clean rag. Find a good clean spot on it. No grit or dirt or debris. And I usually just give that seal face a little wipe out. And we're good. So that's a stationary seal face. Visually inspect it just to make sure that 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 gasket looks like it's all the way seated down in there. I'll let everybody come by and take a look. It's not too much to not too much to go wrong. You want to make sure you're fully seated though, not lopsided. It's also real important to make sure you cleaned out behind the old seal or at least visually inspect it to make sure there's no dirt or debris back there because that could cause that stationary seal to sit lopsided. All right, so we'll set this guy uh, right here. Now I'm getting my hands dirty again. So pump casing wise, we need to recall, and we should have marked this when we started, but we need to recall how the casing was installed on the, the pump uh, housing or the, the motor frame adapter itself. So this was obviously up at the 12 o'clock position. What we're looking for is this tab right here on the seal chamber, that tab needs to fit into, into the seal casing in a specific way. So it's got to fit in right into that notch right there. And that means that if the discharge of the casing was here at the 12 o'clock position, we need to orient the seal adapter housing like so when we're putting everything back together. Here's where you got to be a little careful. You don't want this dropping because it could chip that seal face. All right. So you just want to make sure that this is up there, that it's on, it's good and snug. Be careful you don't bump it so it doesn't fall down and, and chip that seal face. So we're good. We've got the... Thank you, Brandon. So that's, uh, 
installing a stationary seal face, do it nice and clean. That's the biggest key there. So shaft sleeve, we've got that here. We cleaned that up. Don't forget to put the shaft sleeve O-ring back into the shaft sleeve. That seals between the impeller and the shaft from, from creating a leak pad. So I'm going to put that shaft sleeve O-ring back in there. Sometimes they come out real easy, going back in a little tougher. There we go. So we got the shaft sleeve, shaft sleeve over it. Uh, we mentioned this off camera earlier. Note, keep track of your impeller, nut O-ring, and the shaft sleeve O-ring. They look very similar, but if you put the wrong one on the, on the wrong hardware, it may not create the proper sealing pad. So that's step nine, just, just note that. Step 10 is where we get into the fun stuff. This is where we've got to do a quick kind of pit crew dry run of, of what we're about to get into. We're going to install, trying to look for some good parts here. We're going to install the new rotary onto the sleeve, sleeve onto the shaft, and then impeller onto the shaft. One, two, three, pretty quick. You have to pay special attention though as to what direction you put all these components onto. Number one, you saw how hard it was for Brandon to get the old bellows seal off of the sleeve. Well, with the brand new seal, it's going to be just as hard, if not harder. So you get one shot at doing it. Probably should have sent two seals. <laughs> we get one shot at doing it. The number one thing that I've seen done wrong, just oops, mistake, is putting the seal on backwards, putting everything together and going, oh no, I put the seal on backwards, you know, and then, and then it's too late. So if you put the seal on this way, well, your stationary is back there. That seal should be facing this way when, when we put it together. So the, the two polished faces should always contact. Just remember that when you're reassembling this pump. And the sleeve, the orientation of the sleeve, this O-ring should always back up against the impeller. So polished face against polished face, and then O-ring against the impeller. And that's it. So we've got the new seal. The seal over here, sitting on a piece of cardboard. We've got the... Uh, Well, we'll probably just use one of these this time. So you've got, uh, where's the impeller? Impeller's sitting over here. Sleeve over here. Keyway. What's that? Keyway. Keyway? Yeah. You need it now? Ah, uh, no, we don't need the key now. What we're doing right now is we're going to use the impeller simply as like a bushing to help us seat the sleeve in place and then after that uh, we'll take the impeller back off we'll put the spring and the retaining cup on and that's it so again uh, direction of installation in this case is, is critical this is our our rotating seal try not to touch the seal face itself with dirty hands you've got the polished surface here is going to go backwards against the polished surface in the stationary the sleeve is going to go in this direction so we're going to install this onto this using soapy water. Then we're going to install the sleeve and this onto the shaft, followed by the impeller. And then we're going to let it sit for about a minute. And everything should wind up in the on or about the right spot. Remember, keep track of your orientation. Lots of nice, clean, soapy water. All right. Stuff starts drying pretty quick, so you want to keep working fast. Seal goes onto the shaft. Impeller comes on. Well, let's try to get that seal on a little better. That's all right. Hold on. I'm going to do it on the work there. All right. He is working fast, so it doesn't doesn't set up on you. Can we get this uh, impeller off real quick? Should have put some lubricant on the. I got the 
back. Should have put some lubricant between the impeller, yeah. We want to keep that shaft sleeve sliding forward, so we'll just throw some soapy water in there. Put that slide back nice and easy. Now we got to keep driving this uh, as far back as she will go, so we still got a little ways to go. We can use a, unless you can get her on there. Almost there. That's just that O-ring getting caught on this back end of the seal here, so we should be all right. Actually, you can install it as one assembly if you wanted to, but see that bottom's out like that. She's on here like, hey. That's it. We should be bottomed out at that point. All right, so that's a proper, proper set on that seal. We're going to keep that seal there for, for just a little bit. That'll let that soapy water under the, the boot on the seal just kind of grab that sleeve. That's where that's going to stay. Then we'll take the impeller off. We'll go back, put our spring on with the retaining cup or the spring retainer, then the bolt. Then we're pretty much ready to go. So we'll let that sit for a second. All this is doing right now is letting that soapy water dry up on that boot. So it almost, it almost grabs onto that sleeve and stays in that spot. Ready? On this side yep. now. Right. You can pop the impeller off. Careful because the sleeve might come with it. The sleeve it came is. with it. Nope. That's okay. See, all we're trying to do is set the proper working height of, of the bellows on the sleeve. All right, because once, once that soapy water dries up, you know, th this seal has flexibility to it, as you can see. So it's going to be able to move forward and back, but the bellows isn't going to be able to slide on that shaft anymore. So that's pretty much in a fixed location. So we, mission accomplished there, we got that done. I usually get the seal face to check and uh, get a clean rag and just wipe those off. There's a clean rag down in the box. We usually recommend alcohol wipes. Yeah, probably also. Alcohol wipes, all right, we'll grab some alcohol wipes. Those are preferred. Try not to get them on O-rings and things because it's alcohol, but if you get them just on the seal face, that's acceptable just to make sure any of the grit and debris doesn't get on there. At this time also, if you want to put some never seize or anything on the shaft between the sleeve and the shaft, you can do that. Just be careful that when you put the shaft sleeve on, it doesn't ball up and get all over the face of the mechanical seal because it's got that grit to it. Yeah, you can do that as well. That's probably a better idea. What's that? That way it don't come out. Yeah, that way it doesn't squish up on it. Got some nice clean alcohol wipes. Here, this fairly clean one right here. You can use that to watch it. They missed all these done today. Yeah, they all are. I hope at least the alcohol wipe. We're just uh, we're cleaning off the stationary seal face, just to make sure there's not any grit and debris on there. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Do we got never seize on the inside of the shaft sleeve. Slide that back in. Let the seal face its contact. Now remember you've got an O-ring inside this, inside this sleeve here that's gonna ride on the back of the impeller here. Probably wanna throw some soapy water on there to make sure you don't roll that O-ring and, and bite that O-ring when we put the impeller back on. Before we put the impeller back on though, we also need to install these two guys. 
spring and the spring retainer. Pretty self-evident how they fit on there. There's no specific direction. Then some never sees on the inner diameter of the impeller. And we're good to go. Yeah, throw the key back in. Now it's going to have some spring back to it. It's going to want to pop forward. This is where we, uh, yeah, a little soap on the O-ring. Spec calls for 38 inch pounds of torque on this model, 23 SH. Inch pounds I'm sorry, foot pounds. Foot pounds? Foot pounds, yeah. So I usually give the impeller a good push forward, try to get that nut as tight as you can, and then we're going to 38. Uh, try not to rotate the impeller, it just uh, rubs on the O-rings and stuff. Yeah. We go. So pump's pretty much reassembled. The only thing left, put the casing back on. We've already got our seal chamber oriented pretty darn close. Remember you have to line this tab up with the casing. This tab on this side of the seal chamber has to line up with the casing. We've also got to uh, inspect the area on the seal chamber where the casing o-ring is going to ride and make sure that that area is clean of debris. If you need to scotch bright it, so be it. On this casing, we should probably uh, hit that with some scotch pipes so we can clean up this, this where that water got in there and oxidized a little bit. Critical area we're trying to clean on the casing is obviously where the O-ring is gonna gonna sit. Once we have that done, we can reassemble the pump case. So pump casing, remember, not only do you have to orient the flanges correctly, but you've also got to orient that, orient that tab correctly between the seal chamber and the casing itself. You got the tab lined up? All right. Tab lined up and the holes lined up. We did pretty good. If you have a leaking casing day one, one of two things happening. You either split that O-ring, well, or forgot the O-ring, or you didn't line that tab up properly, and you folded the tab over into the back of that casing and generated a leak pad. I've seen that many a time. Want to throw me a couple of those and we'll...